Hi, my name is Marcefon, I'm a classical guitar player and this video is a request from one of my students. Today we are going to talk about how to approach a piece from scratch, from zero. So most of the things that I'm going to tell you today are part of my practice habits and routines, but as well good general advice for when you study music. And with this video I just hope that you probably encounter some positive confirmation that what you are doing is right, or maybe things that you could change or reorganize in order to get better results during your practice sessions. So I'm going to break down the content in two different phases. The one without the guitar, the things that you can do prior taking the guitar, and then the next ones with your instrument. Step one, before you even think of anything else, you should consider if the piece that you want to start practicing is somewhat within your range of skills. A way too difficult piece is just going to cause frustration. So it's important to try to understand how big the challenge you want to take is. For that, of course, it can help you a lot all the repertoire lists that are out there with the methods, with all these uh, graded exams, and compare the pieces that you're currently playing with the ones that kind of surround this grade or maybe the next grade so that you don't jump too many steps ahead. Of course, if you have a teacher, definitely tell to him or her the things that you would like to play and then they should be able to tell you if you are ready for it or maybe not just yet. Step two, that's a personal preference, but I would really encourage you to try to take scores that do not have fingerings or have just the bare minimum because there are scores that really put fingerings on everything, even the obvious parts. And if you're reading music, you just don't want to be reading numbers, some things you want to automate within your brain. On top of that, having no fingerings, it will help you very much to develop the instinct of finding the most appropriate fingering for each part. And that also requires a level of music analysis and understanding in order to make such choices. If you're in the very, very, very beginning, then this step would not apply to you, but if you are somehow intermediate, I would really encourage you that you try to do that. Because if you have all the fingerings written, first you're kind of accepting the outcome of how you're going to play because somebody else wrote it. And as a musician, I would much rather make my own mistakes and my own great things rather than to just follow what somebody else already has done. Of course, this does not take away that you can compare versions, you can compare fingerings from different artists and then pick and choose. But then again, you're already engaging the analytical eye, and that's exactly what you want to do in this step. Step three. In this one, they are opinions of all types. I am the kind of person that I would much rather not listen to all the recordings out there before I even start to play a piece. I prefer to start reading the piece by myself. Many times I will already know how this piece sounds because you have heard it, but I will not go on purpose listening to multiple recordings right before starting to read the piece. I want to give myself the possibility to discover what's written and how the harmonies sound before I'm conditioned by somebody else's voicing or dynamics or anything of this kind. I know it is tempting, but it will increase your attention to things that you might oversee if you have heard the piece too many times. Step four, choose by watching. Looking at the score, try to have an overview of the rhythms that are predominant within the piece. Sometimes it will be very clear, sometimes they are built on 16, sometimes they are very march-like and they have lots of dotted rhythms, and sometimes there is really everything. Then in this case, try to see one voice at a time what each voice is doing. That might be a little bit obvious, but make sure you can play the figurations that are actually written. So practice it before with a metronome. You could even put it in a program like Sibelius or Finale so they can play it for you. And then you can just say it over or play it over with open strings, whatever, until you really get it. Why? Because if you're not 100% sure that you know all the rhythm figurations, then that is going to deform very much how you're going to perform it. It has nothing to do with you not being able to play it, but it's more of you not being able to understand it fully right from the very beginning. Step five. Here we are doing kind of a scan of the piece. Check for the key signature for sharps and flats. And as an extra practice that is really, really good, you could practice your scales, your warm-up scales, 
on the key of your piece. That will help you so much orientating on the fretboard and also on the type of sonority that you're going to be dealing with while you practice this piece. Also, what I like very much to do is really to check the structure. So the larger form. Are there repeating sections? Analyze and be in the lookout for patterns and themes coming back. And even better, make a sign or mark it with a, with a pen or something on your score. That will work so good when you later on start memorizing the piece, when you already have somewhat of an idea of the structure as you're practicing from zero. Step six. Here then we can look to the technical characteristics. Still without playing, just looking at the score, try to see if you can find where the challenging spots are gonna be. This will activate so much your mind understanding really without playing how your hands will be on the fretboard. That's a super, super useful exercise. So try to look if there are going to be difficult jumps or difficult chord sequences, sometimes very big chords that do not have any open strings. Just circle all those parts that you think they're going to be challenging. Make some sort of a red marking in there because that's going to come in very handy later on to practice them individually. By the way, remember to like and subscribe if you're enjoying the video and if you would like to have more content like this. So of course you could do a lot more exercises without the guitar, like singing the melody, beating the rhythms, analyze every single chord of the piece. But I wanted to give you something somewhat realistic and not too heavy to begin with because let's face it, when we want to start a new piece, we just want to go and play. So the steps that I told you before are things that you can do within 10 minutes of sitting with a paper and just reading through the music without actually feeling like you are exercising or anything. For me, it's some sort of like musical zapping. Now we go to the next phase with the guitar. So once you have done this quick visual scan of the musical material, now we will have to set some sort of organization so that you don't fall into the bad habit of starting from the beginning and then eventually arriving at a certain point that is difficult and you re-loop from the beginning and then you stop right there again and re-loop from the beginning and somehow you never go really anywhere and you can stay weeks and weeks doing that. And this is the worst thing you can do to embed mistakes get bored of that first section, first page, whatever you're playing, and also have a huge imbalance between you're just overplaying the part that you can actually play and you're not facing the trouble spots or the part of the piece that is actually challenging you a lot more. So depending on the difficulty of the piece, you can adapt this as you see it more fit. So I would recommend you to start reading chunks of four bars as in most of our repertoire, this has already some musical sense to it. If the music is really difficult or you're practicing for the first time a fugue and it's very, very dense, then just feel free to chunk it to two bars or even one bar at a time. Start to play this section very, very, very slowly, trying to figure out the, the notes, where you play them, which fingering would be the best. Try to understand how the voicing works. That might help you deciding on some fingering choices for color, for string and everything. And try to connect the notes as much as you can. Of course, here you should know the style characteristic of each type of music, baroque, classical. But let's say that you will have the, the lessons with your teacher and you still know nothing about it. Try to choose a fingering that makes sense to you and then you can compare with what your teacher says and learn from there and why your choices were good and maybe others were not. Because of course, in fingering choice, the articulation plays a huge role on it. But this is part of learning. In the beginning, you know nothing, you make all the mistakes and as somebody corrects you, you start to understand these characteristics and you start to develop an instinct as to the ways that are better and the ones that are really, really not fitting in this type of music. Now let's suppose that you know the fingering, so you will repeat that unity that you decided, that one bar, those two bars, or these four bars, very slowly and try to get until the end. Sometimes you might encounter that the trouble spot is really just one change, so work it a little, and then try to aim that at the end of this practice session you can play slowly, 
spot somewhat anticipating where you have to go and how you have to move five times without mistakes. If you want to be a little bit more strict, go for 10 times in a row without mistake. That means if you make a mistake at the seventh repeat, you start all over. That kind of helps to awake this demanding voice inside of you that will help you to be a little bit more strict during your practice sessions, which is exactly what you need. Being very strict during your practice and very free and tolerate a lot when you just perform. This is a very easy thing to say, but you need to walk that path and it's a long, long road. Then having this structure, then really don't aim to play the entire piece at once. Depending on the time that you have available, you say, okay, I think I can afford with this piece, with this type of level, to do one line per day or half a page per day or one page per day. That depends on how easy this piece is for you. It depends also the amount of time that you're practicing. It depends on how much attention you can put into practicing. It depends on so many things. So just find the right place for you there. There is really no right or wrong. The goal of this is that you don't fall into the loop we mentioned before and you just play the same section for a week, two weeks, a month. And with this type of structure, hopefully you should get until the end of the piece in a known amount of time. That is also motivating because you see somehow the duration of the whole thing and you see somehow the trajectory. Many people for this use the metronome as some sort of motivator because then they can do the entire piece at that given speed very slowly and then they can do a second pass a little bit faster and like this progressively and you have a very very clear how to say practice journey. For me it's never that straight, I don't practice with a metronome that much, I use it very strategically but there are so many ways to practice so if that is helpful to you go ahead and give it a shot. Now one thing that I will really like to mention is don't fall into the mistake of first I put the fingers on the fretboard and I know what I have to do technically and later on I will worry about music. This for me is only okay when you're just reading the, the piece that you're literally just stumbling upon one note and the other and maybe here and that and there is no tempo, you're just figuring it out. But once you more or less know the piece and you can play the passage slowly, even if it's snail speed, do not ignore the music. Follow the voices, try to play beautifully from the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to be spending a quite large amount of time practicing something in a way that is not really how you want to perform it. And even though you know it like you're in the technical part of practicing, your brain is embedding this type of repetitions, your brain is embedding this type of musicality, the brain is embedding this type of, of speed or this type of metronome agogics, which is the anti-agogics. So do try to add music practice um, from the early stages. But here of course it comes the part of everybody is different. At a certain depth it's very difficult to tell you exactly what you have to do at every given moment. We all have different processes, we all understand things differently and some students are very musical and you don't need to reinforce that part that much because they have it already but maybe they need more technical control and some students are the contrary. Some people are very, very technical and they can play, but then it's very hard to make them play musically. And the way that everybody digests all this process is very, very different. So with all these ideas of the video, I hope that it makes you think how you are as a musician, how you could be better, and without comparing yourself with others, just self-analysis and self-understanding, and then just pick and choose the things that will benefit you. That's a great thing of having so many sources of information now online, all these YouTube things, and hopefully I can contribute a little bit to just help you in your own thing. Just be you. So good news for you is I will make a second part of this video, more practical part of the explanation, because today was a lot of talking. And in the second video, I will be practicing from scratch a piece that is fairly difficult in counterpoint so that I can show you somehow in real time all the thoughts and processes that I go through when I read a brand new piece and how I make all my decisions from technical to musical. So I hope that the second part will round up and 
make much more clear and obvious all these things that we just talked about. So I hope that this video helps you having a bit of a clearer perspective and I really hope that it helps many of you to practice better and much more goal-oriented. In our case, performance-oriented. Even though if you're not a concert player, you do want to have the pleasure to finish a piece and be able to play it even if it's for your cat or for your wife or for the plants that you have in the living room. Also because practicing focused on music, it is so much more enjoyable than just practice obsessed over technique all the time. At the end of the day, we practice technique to make our hands more capable to just produce the expression that we want. So expect next week the second part of this video and keep me posted here down below if you have any questions about your process of taking up a piece from scratch or about the things that I just said in the video. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I wish you a very nice day. Practice well and I'll see you in the next one.